Okay, let's go ahead and go back to Romans 11. That's where, that's where we were. Uh, so we'll just go back there and we can uh, we can go over this. Just I need the scriptures on the PowerPoint. It sure works a lot better because there's things in there I need to illustrate. So anyway. In our last session, two weeks ago, we postponed last week because of the floods and everything. Uh, we uh, stopped at verse 22 because of some things I wanted to talk about in that verse more than uh, than we did. That was kind of at the end of last session, and so uh, that, you know we didn't want to take the time to, to really go into this. Better that safe and we'll talk about it tonight. So. Uh, subject we're talking about here, if you remember, is the where Paul is talking about Israel as the natural branches. They grew out of the tree. Uh, we talked about the tree, and that it's, the tree is not Israel. Uh, they are the you know they're the natural branches. We're the wild branches grafted in as Gentiles. Because they were broken off. They were broken off because of unbelief. But the tree is, is God's plan and purpose, His, His means and uh, uh, way, I guess, of uh, accomplishing His will. It's like His plan and purpose. He called Israel out as a nation, as a special people, and grafted them in to His plan and purpose to use them to repossess his chosen land and to represent him in the world, to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the world. Uh, that was what they were supposed to do. We know they never did that. Uh, so at a point in time, <clears throat> talk about this a lot where after they had rejected their Messiah, they were given another chance, an extension of mercy uh, for a, about a year. Some people say different amounts of time here. I think it was about a year. Anyway, once again, they rejected the Holy Spirit and God suspended their program. At that point, Israel as the natural branches were broken off. God called out Paul revealed to him the mystery of the gospel of Christ and what he was now doing, the change that was taking place, and a change took place right there. Israel was broken off. The Gentile believers were grafted in to God's plan and purpose, what he was going to do in the world and what he is doing at this time. It's primarily uh, the, the, the Gentiles' times to be in the center and focus of God's plan and purpose. The church, the body of Christ, which is primarily made up of Gentiles. This is a thing that nobody saw because God hadn't revealed it to anybody before He revealed it to Paul. And this is the period of time we're in now. This is how God is working now. In the body of Christ, uh, primarily made up of Gentiles, but also Jews too. So uh, we talked about that some last time, but there's something I want to point out I didn't think of last time, and it, it's not a big deal, but it is something we need to notice because this goes along with the Bible study methods that we follow in uh, learning to properly interpret the Bible and properly understand it. Okay, as we were reading through Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, and now into chapter 11. We can see that Paul is explaining all this to the Jewish believers. What has happened? Why the prophetic things they were expecting didn't happen? Uh, they haven't been cast completely off. God will still finish His business with them. A remnant will remain and so forth. And we'll talk a little bit more about that yet to come. 
and, and all these things. Paul uses a lot of scriptures. You probably remember over the last few weeks we've gone through this. Verses in Isaiah after Isaiah, Psalms and Jeremiah, and all Deuteronomy, all through the Old Testament scriptures. Up to this point, Paul has has used these things, things that those Jewish believers would have related to and understood and been familiar with. They knew all those scriptures that were speaking to them. But notice there's a change here when we get to verse 13. He says, For I will speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. Now, when we talked about this last time, we looked at the verses in Galatians that coincided with Acts 15, where they had a big council in Jerusalem, and they determined that, uh, that uh, Peter and the apostles, they would go to the Jews, and Paul and Barnabas and Silas and those guys, they would go to the Gentiles. So, uh, in a number of times, Paul identifies himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. He had a special ministry to the Gentiles. Peter and the apostles, their ministry, their writings, their dealings were with that remnant of Jewish believers that uh, remained until you know they all died. So uh, that that's why we say in this where Paul says, "I you know speak to you Gentiles," inasmuch as I, as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. That's why we say Paul's writings. Primarily, Romans through Philemon are our direct <coughs> instructions for the body of Christ today. All the scriptures are for our learning, but they're not all directly for our uh, direct instructions. Paul's writings are, because he is our apostle. We know that too because uh, over there in, uh, well, Acts chapter <coughs> was it 9 and... Uh, also, Acts 26, I'm not going to turn over there, we have those accounts where Jesus called out Paul on the road to Damascus, identified himself, and told Paul what he was going to do. He said, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. So, we can be confident that uh, you know Paul is the one who wrote what basically we need to know and understand and we need to follow. And the other scriptures, uh, for us to get, gain a proper understanding of them, uh, we need to look at those in light of what Paul teaches us. So anyway, but there's a change after this. Uh, because after verse 13, he uh, he talks a little bit about the you know the first fruit and the lump and so on, which even the, the Gentiles may have understood about that. But then he goes into a very simple illustration when he starts talking about grafting trees. And notice, after he says, look, I'm, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. I'm your apostle. He doesn't, throughout this section here where he's talking about the grafted in and things like that, he's not using any scripture references. He's not quoting Isaiah or the Psalms or Deuteronomy or, or any of that. Why? Because he's speaking to Gentiles who really weren't all that familiar with the scriptures. So anyway, and that's why he uses this this illustration about grafting limbs into a tree because he knew they would understand that. They could relate to that. Uh, interesting that, uh, you know, they uh, know that actually grafting is uh, uh, skill, an art that apparently goes way back into ancient history. You know, they knew how to do that way back ancient times. Uh, interesting. Okay. So, we left off at verse 22 last time. Uh, so I'm going to try to hack my way through this without the PowerPoint. We'll do the best we can. So let's read verse 22. Be Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, talking about Israel, they stumbled and they fell, not to their total destruction, but you know uh, they they fell. Remember this. Here, where it's talking about Israel's fall, it's not talking that they fell and disappeared or vanished from history. What that fall is talking about is that they fell from their exalted place as a special nation 
in God's plan and purpose. Where, you know, they were set apart as a uh, nation of, or they were to be a nation of kings and priests. Uh, special people called out, set above the Gentiles. Well, they fell from that. And so now, although the covenants remain and the promises remain, and God will fulfill them at the end, uh, end times yet to come, right now, God is not dealing with Israel as a special nation of people. That He's dealing with them just like He's dealing with everybody else. Uh, within the, uh, the gospel of Christ and so forth. So that, that's what the fall here means. That was Israel's fall, what they fell from. Uh, on them which fell, which is Israel's severity, but toward thee goodness. So they received the severity, severe treatment from God, but God was just in His dealings with them because He had told them what was going to happen. I mean, they knew all the way back here in Leviticus, when he, in Leviticus 26, when he lined out those five cycles of judgment and he told them exactly what he was going to do if they did a certain thing, this was going to be the result. And time after time, they did the thing and the result came and they didn't learn. They did the next thing and the, that result came and it got worse and worse each time until down here, they were in that third part of the fifth cycle of judgment and there is one that last part that far, fourth part of the fifth cycle yet to come that's that seven year tribulation period but uh, they, they knew what was going to come so God was totally just in what he in fact really God was extremely merciful and graceful to Israel because he could have when, when, when they committed what they did here in fulfilling that Psalm 2 prophecy where the, you know, the uh, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine the vain thing and they, you know, uh, the rulers of the earth and uh, the uh, rulers and the kings of the earth have uh, conspired together against the Lord and against His anointed. Here, they did that. And Satan had brought in his darkness which gave him the right to then bring in his man here. So had God not suspended the program with Israel right there, then some really bad things would have happened. This, I mean, the whole tribulation and so forth, Israel just almost would have been destroyed. So anyway, it really was a great act of mercy on God's part for him to suspend Israel's program and include them in the gospel of Christ, in the dispensation of grace, where they too could uh, repent, believe in their Messiah, and you know, and uh, be justified by grace through faith, just like us, just like the Gentiles. So it really was very merciful what God did at that point in just breaking them out of the tricky grafting the Gentiles in. So, they received this severity, which was just on His part, and we, uh, Gentiles, received His goodness, which, you know, uh, that, that again, was totally by His grace and mercy. Because at this point, when Israel made, walked contrary to God, yet once again, and made themselves His enemies, the, well, the Gentiles were right there too. So everybody at this point was guilty. And the entire world was worthy of God's wrath coming down at that point. So everything after that, because God didn't pour out His wrath at that point. I mean, that demonstrates God's just unbelievable grace and mercy and what he did after that. Uh, you know, it, it's one of those things we, you know, we, we talked about this here a while back. And every now and then this thought just strikes me how that as people, you know, we, we think we know all that there is to know about God. We know what he has revealed to us about himself. We don't know everything about God. We don't know everything about his plan and purpose and, uh, and 
you know, what all he yet has in store and all, but but the the more we learn about these things, we can really see the intricate genius of God's plan and how he put all this together. So anyway, let's go on and read. Uh, on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. And then here's this conditional phrase. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, before we go any further, we got to make this, we got to be clear on this. Do not confuse this with our justification. Do not confuse this with, uh, with salvation. Remember the, the three, the three things we have in Justification is our uh, <coughs> abbreviated justification unto eternal life. Um, that's our, I guess we could say, our change in status with God. Whereas before we were we were enemies, uh, especially as Gentiles, we were twice dead. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and we were dead in the uncircumcision of our flesh. So we were dead because we weren't in the, the covenants. We weren't part of that. And we were also dead because we were sinners. But our change in status by grace through faith in Christ's finished work on the cross changed that and made us alive in Christ and made us justified before God. That's uh, something that we, of course, get as a free gift. It's, it's unconditional. If we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, believe the gospel of Christ, then we're, we're justified before God. Positionally changed. No longer enemies, no longer dead in sins. We're, we're changed. You remember our new, identification, our, our, our new identity in Christ that we receive as we talked about that. Uh, then there's our <coughs> sanctification. And I'm just going to go ahead and write this. Because it's, in, it's important that we know this definition. working of the Spirit of God through the Word of God in our inner man. Now, if you remember back in chapter 8, we talked a lot about this, that our sanctification is the, the working of God, the working of the Spirit of God through the Word of God in our inner man. To do what? To conform us to the image of Christ. To produce godliness in us. That godly thinking, godly living, and godly laboring with Him as mature, growing, educated, equipped sons and daughters laboring with our Father and what He's accomplishing in the world. Now, our, our justification, basically, that's something God does. When we place our faith in Christ, God completes that work in us. We can't do that. We, we, we have nothing to do. Other, our only part in justification is say, yes, I believe. We we'll believe in our heart that uh, the gospel of Christ and so forth. God does that. Our sanctification work, He also does that too. We know that. Paul tells us because it's the working of the Spirit of God through the Word of God in our inner man. But our sanctification is conditional. We don't just automatically become Christ-like. Just because we're saved... We don't, uh, we don't automatically grow in the Spirit. 
We don't automatically learn the Word. We don't automatically learn how to do good things for Jesus and, and all those kind of things. We don't automatically learn how to lead people to Christ or uh, understand the Bible. We teach it or, or whatever. Those things of... We don't automatically learn how to think with godly thoughts, live godly, and labor with Him effectively in what He's doing in the world. Uh, it's conditional upon us being properly educated in the Word. Now, if we're... This is why it's so important that we learn right division and what specific parts apply to us and the others that don't. Uh, one of the reasons, and you've, you've probably come to notice this in your own study, and I hope you have, is that once you learn about right division and then you go back here and you read stuff like from Genesis through Acts 8, and you understand, and you look at that from the standpoint that that applies to Israel, and we can stop trying to dig stuff out of there and somehow wrangle it around to apply to us, and it makes it a whole lot more clear and a lot more understandable, and, uh, and so on. Same thing with uh, Hebrews through Revelation and so on. So, making this whole point to... Not qualify, that's not the right word. Uh, explain or, I guess, uh, disclaimer, I guess, clarify, bring some clarity to this phrase, if thou continue in his goodness. Did, did, remember, we're after chapter 6, we've all, already covered in chapters 3 through 5. We covered everything that Paul needed for us to learn about our justification. Starting at chapter 6, we started working into those things about our sanctification. Really, I mean, chapters 3 through 5, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in there about our justification. And he explains a lot. But uh, the greater part of our education comes in the details about our sanctification. Because we have a part in this. Our main part is, say, is saying, yes, Father, I understand this. I, I, I see this is what you want to do with us. And I, I'm in. Count me in. That, that's like the starting point. And then, you know, we begin to learn and grow. It's a lifelong thing. We never stop our sanctification process. Unfortunately, too many people never begin their sanctification because they've been told that all they need to do is get saved and that's all they ever need. And, and unfortunately, too many churches, preachers, whatever, are under the impression that all they ever need to do is just get people saved. Once you're saved, that's all you need. God will do the rest. Well, He won't just do the rest because there's some work we have to do too. We have to learn the Word. You know, and we have to learn it and, and uh, learn how to properly study it and proper means of interpretation and you know gather in groups and talk about it and discuss it and ask questions among ourselves and dig into these things and find out what they mean and all that and, uh, and, and through all that we learn what these things mean and we learn how to live these things out and We'll see when we get into the next chapter, chapter 12, and that's where the really the instructions, because we've, we've been grounded and educated and got the foundation up to that point, and then in verse 12, then we start going through the, like the, I'm not going to say rules, because it's not rules, but it's the instructions of, you know, uh, uh, the practical working out of the working of the Spirit through the Word in our inner man. And remember, it's in our, in our inner man. We won't find any promises of physical blessing and all that in any of Paul's instructions to us. Remember back in chapter 8, when Paul's talking about our physical body? What does he say about that? What does he say we're waiting for? We're waiting for the redemption of our body. That The only hope our physical bodies have 
is their redemption. <laughs> you know, that's the only hope our physical bodies have. Because we're not given any promises of blessings like Israel was. Remember, when we did, went through the short uh, series a while back on the God's economics, we're, we're still under the covenant with Noah, where he said, you know, plant and grow crops and the seasons will uh, not cease, planting and harvest from now on. Here's the resources of the earth, spread out over it and use the resources for your living. That's what we're under. So anyway, uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Remember that e even through all of this section, we're still talking about our sanctification and we're learning about that. And there are some conditional things to our sanctification. Remember back in chapter 8 where he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the flesh and not after the Spirit. Also he said, uh, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be we suffer with Him. And there's some other things in there. There are conditional things about our sanctification. So, uh, now, we're, we're not... If, uh, okay, for people who are justified, but they never... They, they just, I don't know, they stay in church and they're never taught anything about sanctification... They go through their whole life and they never take part in their sanctification. They're not, what I understand, they're not going to be condemned for that, but they're going to miss out because there are some things that they needed to have learned and accomplished in the Spirit, in their inner man, that they just never did. So, you know, I guess in the heavenlies, they're going to be children or something. I mean, maybe we'll be teaching them. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, people think that uh, we're all going to understand it all by and by. Well, that's not so. Uh, I think a whole lot of what what we learn about God's Word now, we're going to take it with us. If you don't learn it here, you're not going to get it there. <laughs> you know, I don't think we're just going to bang all of a sudden have all knowledge when we get to heaven. Uh, so anyway, I got well deal on that, but I just want to make the point where it says, If thou continue in His goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. We're not talking about salvation from the death penalty of sin. We're not talking about justification. We're talking about sanctification. God's working in our lives and God's the tree of God's goodness, His plan and purpose and how He's working. Paul's saying, look, don't think. Look, he said, look here what happened to Israel. God broke them off and grafted you in. Now, don't think that He can't break you off and graft them back in. We know that that's going to happen in the, in the future. Let me go ahead and read, or let's read some more of these uh, verses uh, 23 and 24. It says, And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Uh, let me go ahead and read a little bit more. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Israel <coughs> broken off because of their unbelief, if they were broken off because of their unbelief, he's saying the time will come when they will not remain in unbelief. But when they come back into belief and you Gentiles are in unbelief, you'll be broken off and Israel will be grafted back in. Okay. Let's think about our world today. Let's think about Gentiles in general. God chose way back there with Paul to open up the way of salvation to the Gentiles. The gospel of Christ revealed to them these mysteries, mystery of the gospel of Christ, the mystery of how God was working now with the Gentiles and Israel was 
broken off and so forth. Uh, let's look at the Gentile world today. And let's try to look at it from God's perspective. What do, do we see the Gentile world in general in a state of belief in God and in God's Word? Disbelief. Disbelief. Okay. At what point <laughs> would the Gentile world get to the point where it's like Israel was and God says, okay, you're in unbelief and there are the, 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 the believing remnant of Israel are starting to, starting to grow, starting to emerge. God says, that's enough. And the, and the favor that the Gentile world enjoys now by being within God's plan and purpose and having the opportunity to have access to the gospel of Christ, to God's word, and having the opportunity and the privilege of being in the place of, of prominence in what God is doing in the world. Uh, okay, when it comes to the point where that's not happening anymore and the Gentiles are taken out of that place of favor with God and the focus of His plan and purpose. Think about this. We've never experienced in our lives, because this has been going on for nearly 2,000 years or so, we haven't experienced the Gentile world not in the focus of God's plan and purpose. That's what's going to happen at this point when that covenant is made. We're going to read this references in a minute. When that covenant is made by the Antichrist, and at that point, that's one of the things that's going to happen. The Gentile world is going to reach a point where, okay, back here we've talked about how that Satan's darkness had increased, his cleverly crafted set of untruths that were designed to take the place of God's truth by being more appealing than God's truth itself. That happened here, and He brought in His darkness. It kind of got short-circuited here, but He just started over. And He's bringing it in, and, and He will have it at the same point here, right at the beginning of the tribulation, that He had it back here. What do we see in the world today? We see these conditions. We see where there are multiple sets of falsehoods and counterfeits and false religions out there that are cleverly crafted and designed to be more appealing to people than God's Word itself. What do we see in the Gentile world today? We see that certain lifestyles are, you know, a few, a few years ago, and we all saw this coming, it was tolerance. They wanted tolerance and equality. Well, now they don't, and tolerance and equality wasn't enough now. Now it's, it's ex exaltation. And they're exalted above all, you know, especially the emphasis with the terrorist attack. Oh, excuse me, no, wait a minute. The news media calls it the shooting rampage. Wasn't a terrorist attack, in spite of the fact that this Muslim gunman was shouting Allahu Akbar and all that kind of stuff, and calling on the phone, pledging his allegiance to ISIS and all. But they've redacted all that stuff, you know, because they don't want anybody to know about that. And they've spun this to, you know, I don't mean to get on a soapbox about it, but they've spun this to be a, you know, just one more mass shooting. No, it was a terrorist attack, you know. And of course, the fact that he shot up a, a gay bar, oh man, now, you know, uh, our media and our government, and it seemed like all of the motivators in our culture and society can't bend over backwards enough to exalt the homosexual lifestyle, you know? And so, uh, I don't know, this may be the last time I'm on YouTube, but just saying stuff like that, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and what's, what's going to be the next step? The next step is that it's going to be a prosecutable offense for you to stand up here like I'm doing right now and say what I'm saying and put it on YouTube. You know? Maybe in jail. But 
The point being that we see what Paul is talking about here. And, you know, let's get a little closer to home. We talk about this all the time. Conditions of what we see in a lot of churches. Man, they've all gone so far off the track that they're nowhere near <coughs> having any clear understanding of what's going on. Uh, you know. So, anyway, we're going to see the, the days that I, or I say we'll see. We may not. may not happen in our lifetime. But if conditions that we see in the world presently continue in their current course, then I believe we're going to see these end time things happen within our lifetime. And uh, of course, you know, commonly among the church at large today, we're told that we don't need to worry about any of that because we're all going to be whisked out of here. Well, I don't believe that's true. But you know, before it all happens. Uh, All right, one other thing. What time is this eight? Let's see if I'm going to talk about this tonight or not. I don't think I'm going to because there's verse 25. Uh, no, I don't. I'm going to stop at verse 25 because there's some things I want to talk about there that are really we could if we wanted to go a whole other hour tonight we could, or maybe not an hour, but it, it would probably turn into that. Because there's some prophetic things here, since we're talking about prophetic things, that we need to look at, but there are some, some scripture references we want to go to, and uh, there's some really important things we need to look at here. And it'll take more time, really, than what we had tonight. So I think I'm going to stop right there in verse 25, and uh, we'll come back to this next week. Because here where he talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. We want to take a look at that, make sure we understand what that means. The reason it's important, and I emphasize that, is because this, this phrase, the fullness of the Gentiles, is a phrase that has been misdefined terribly. Uh, and when we talk about it, you'll see what I, you'll see what I mean. You, you, you'll see, because it's you will have heard this before. Sure. So we'll uh, we'll stop it. We didn't make it very far. We only made three verses. Uh, so we'll pick up there in verse twenty-five next time and uh, talk about that. Uh, anybody else got any soapbox comments you can rant and rave about tonight? You know they. Uh, Look at my notes again. To make sure I'm not cover that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where we are. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll talk about that next time.